If you are a guest with us here at Living Hope Church, um, we are so thankful that you've chosen to join us. We know that there are a lot of really great churches in Alpena, and the fact that you're here is just an awesome, awesome blessing for us. So Living Hope, would you give our guests a warm Living Hope welcome? Yeah. Okay, well, we have been in a series now that I have titled 10 Steps to Change Your Life. And uh, we've been in this series now. This is going to be the 10th week that we've been in this series. And we're going to conclude today. And I hope you guys have enjoyed this, uh, this series. I have. I've enjoyed studying um, the Word and, and really communicating with you guys what the Lord is speaking to us. Now, uh, if, you, if you don't know, maybe you're new here, the whole idea behind this series is that God has given us in Scripture 10 steps that if we would take these steps... If we would actively pursue these steps, our life would change. We would begin living the life that God is destined for us to live. And of course, those steps are found in Exodus chapter 20, and those are the Ten Commandments. They're the very basic aspects of, of life and what God has called us to live by. And the first, in our first week of this series, we, we looked at the question, why? Why has God given us the Ten Commandments? And we learned that from Exodus all the way into Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 22, we learned that really the message has not changed. Um, God calls us to love him and to love people. And that is what we need to do. Uh, that's what the Ten Commandments are about. We broke them down. The first four commandments are what we call vertical commandments. They're the commandments that help us to connect with the heart of God, to connect with who He is and His nature and His character. And the remaining six commandments we call the horizontal commandments. Those are the commandments that help us to connect with the world around us. And when Jesus was challenged by the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, when they asked Him, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment? He said, the first, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Guys, the message has never changed. We're to love God and love people. And so we began going through these steps or these commandments one by one. And the first week, uh, I'm sorry, the second week, we went through the first two, which was to love the Lord your God and put him first and to not make idols for ourselves. And week three was the, to not take the Lord's name in vain. Week four, um, we talked about how we need to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy and what that means for us as followers of Jesus is that our rest is found in Jesus Week five was the first of the horizontal steps, the relational steps, and we talked about honoring our mother and father and what that is and what that isn't and how we live that out in our lives. Week six, you shall not murder. Week seven, we discuss what it means to not commit adultery. Week eight, you shall not steal. And then in week nine, last week, Renee did a great job communicating what it means to not bear false witness and what that is. And so thank you, babe, for, for teaching. Did a great job. A little biased, but you know. Um, <laughs> uh, look at that. <laughs> but this week, though, we're going to continue. We're going to go to the 10th step, the final step, the final commandment, concluding this series. But before we get into it, like always, we're people of prayer. So let's go ahead and pray. Let's ask God to bless our time together. Would you guys join me? Well, Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you for so much for everything that you've blessed us with. Your presence, God, is so tangible in this room. We thank you for the gift of salvation that's found in your son, Jesus. I pray today as we conclude this series, I pray that you would help us to actively live out these steps in our lives, God. Lord, help us to live out the Ten Commandments. Help us to find peace and contentment anywhere that we are, whatever season or situation we may find ourselves in. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me this morning, God. Lord, let my words be grounded in your word and my thoughts reflect your heart. I love you so much, Jesus. Amen. Hey, babe, would you hand me my coffee cup? Thanks. All right. So, from, from birth, there are two aspects of our life that are manifestations of our sin nature that we do not have to learn how to do. Um, there are two aspects of humanity in which, in, in sin, that nobody has to teach us, nobody has to train us. We automatically, because of our sin nature, we automatically know how to do this. So I have a son, Ezra. And uh, he's three. He'll be four in February. 
And he's the little kid who's always running around here without shoes on. And you'll hear me say, Ezra, where are your shoes? You know, that, that's him. And so, um, so he's always running around here. So he, he has favorite toys, and, and, uh, and he's playing with this little, it was like a little hammer, and a little plastic hammer, and he's playing with this plastic hammer, and his sister's sitting next to him, and all of a sudden you hear this, Ow! Ezra, why'd you hit me? And, uh, and you know, I look at Ezra, and I'm like, Ezra, what are you doing? And he's like, and I said, did you just hit your sister? No. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, dude. And I always call my, sorry, all right, I, I'm weird as a dad. I always call my kids dude and bro. I'm like, bro, like, you just, you, are you kidding me? Like, you just, you just hit her. Like, did you hit your sister? No. I'm like, she's got a whelp on her head. You know, like, no. <laughs> we don't have to teach kids how to lie. They just naturally know how to lie. And so Ezra, one of his other favorite toys here, it's actually, we always see it around, is this little motorcycle that he plays with. And, you know, and then comes Eli. And Eli is my second youngest son. And, uh, and so here's Eli. He sees Ezra playing with his little motorcycle. And, you know, it's like, oh, man, this thing I have is super cool. But, man, that motorcycle, that's something else. You know, and so Ezra's playing with his motorcycle. And Eli's just waiting for the moment, you know, and Ezra decides to put the motorcycle down just for a second to grab a drink, and here comes Eli, snatch, and all of a sudden there's another, oh, you know, and then tears and crying, and, you know, so like, we don't have to teach kids how to lie, and we don't have to teach kids how to covet, because man, it doesn't matter what it is. If there's a sibling that has a toy, they want it. It does not matter what it is. We do not have to teach kids how to do those things. It comes natural to them. And anybody who's a parent can confirm with me on that. Amen? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to remind you of a saying today that has grounded me and our family and many people uh, for much of our life. And it's a saying that we all know. It's, all, it's a saying that we've all heard a thousand times, probably said a thousand times. Here's a truth that I want you to re remind you of this morning. The grass is not always greener on the other side of the fence. The grass is not always greener on the other side of the fence. And today's last step that God has given us in his word, the last commandment that we're going to go through, is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and pull those out. I want you to flip to two places, the book of Exodus, and I want you to flip to the book of Philippians chapter 4. So Exodus 20 and Philippians chapter 4. Those are going to be the two places we're hanging out today. And in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17... If you don't have your Bibles, it'll be up on the screen. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17 says this. It says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. So that's the last commandment that God gives us. The tenth commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, wife, male servant, female servant, ox, donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, I find the wording of this commandment a bit funny. I mean, obviously, it's, this was an issue in the Old Testament, in ancient Israel, and um, there were very specific things that they had issues with that people were obviously coveting of their neighbors. Um, and I could see, like, coveting somebody's house. Like, I could see that, you know, like, you know, like, man, yeah, we could, we struggle with that today, I think some people do. They're like, wow, man, they have such a beautiful home. I wish I could have something like that. So I could see that, you know, like, don't covet your neighbor's wife. I mean, I could see that, you know, whatever. Um, don't covet your neighbor's, um, you know, your neighbor's servants. Of course, that, I don't know how that applies to us. It doesn't. But hey, you know, like, I could see how that would be an issue back then. But then you get to, don't covet your neighbor's donkey. And, <laughs> and, and I think that one's kind of funny. You know, I just imagine this, like, this, like, ancient Hebrew guy, and he's, like, standing at his fence, and he's like, dang. That guy's got such an awesome donkey. You know, like, he's just like, I wish I had a donkey like that. You know, <laughs> and it was just funny to me. I suppose that could be like a car today. I don't know. But, but you know, whatever. So here we are. So God gives us uh, all these, these aspects of do not coveting. And then he sums it up with don't covet anything that is your neighbor's. And in the original Hebrew language, that word covet would have been the Hebrew word kamad. And that means to desire, more specifically, to desire greatly. Now, throughout most of this series, we've been looking at all of these different steps or commandments from both the macro perspective, from the larger picture, 
and from the micro perspective how it applies to us more personally today as followers of Jesus. And typically how that's translated is the macro perspective. Typically is how we, it's interpreted in the Old Testament versus how Jesus or the New Testament teachings translate this to apply to us today. So to do, desire something greatly, when you desire something greatly, one thing, a phrase we use in our family, and Renee and I use is, something can easily become a time suck. It sucks the time away from you. We'll call it a time vacuum. So for example, when I, uh, when I gain an interest in something, no matter what it is, um, I'm a all or nothing person. And she's nodding her head, yes. Because it's like, you know, it's like when I discovered wristwatches, it was like, oh. And all of a sudden now, you know, it's like I'm reading about them, I'm learning about them, and I'm figuring out the parts and how they work and who made what and the history of them. And all of a sudden, it's been two and a half hours and I've been on YouTube. You guys have never been there, right? You know, like with an interest of yours. But, you know, you get sucked in and you're watching all these things on YouTube. And it, these, these interests, these things become, uh, become time vacuums where they get things from you that you can never get back. That's exactly what coveting can become. When we covet something, not only can become a time vacuum, but it also can become a focused vacuum. Not only is our time gone, but now our focus is gone. It can become an energy vacuum where we're placing all of our energy into this thing and we're losing focus and all of a sudden, before we even recognize it or understand it or know why, it all of a sudden it becomes a peace vacuum and that's all of a sudden when you know you've entered into the realm of coveting because you lose peace over this. From a macro perspective, there's looking at your neighbor's donkey and saying, hey, that's a sweet donkey. You know, like, but then, but then there's looking at your neighbor's donkey and saying, why does he need such a sweet donkey? If I had a donkey like that, my life would be so much better. I'd get so much more done. My life would be better if I just had a donkey like that guy. You know, like, that's when you step into the realm of coveting, you know, and you say, if I just had that guy's donkey, all my problems would go away. You know, and whatever, it's insert house, car, career, spouse, family, whatever. If I just had that, man, that's coveting. That's what it looks like for the ancient Israelites when God is speaking this commandment. That's what it looks like from a macro perspective for us today. And there's some serious realities, there's some serious aspects of coveting that, that really affect our lives when we allow um, a covetous nature or a covetous, I, I, don't want, I don't want to say spirit, that's not the right word, but when we allow coveting to come into our life, when we open ourselves up to that, there's some serious realities that happen. The first reality is this, covetousness is, an incredibly, is incredibly damaging because it robs us of our peace. Now, what do I mean by that? When you covet something, when you greatly desire it, now, we're not talking like, hey, that guy has a nice car. But when you're thinking, that car would change everything for me. Like, you know, like, you get it with the single guys who are like 20 years old, you know, and they're like, man, if I just had, because all the ladies would want me if I had this car, you know, and all the ladies are like, yeah, right, Paul. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> doesn't work like that. Um, that's, you know, that, that's coveting. When you greatly desire something and it becomes the object of our focus, the object of our thought life, when we choose to covet, what we're doing is we're choosing to forfeit our peace because we no longer find satisfaction in the things that we already have. But instead, we're looking to what others have for satisfaction. And the problem with that is, is that others have it, we don't. And because we don't have it, and that's all we want, and that's what we're desiring, we're never going to find peace. Because that's what we're trying to find our peace in, is that thing that we don't have. It's like the proverbial carrot in front of the donkey. It's like you're always chasing after it. So the fruit of coveting is a forfeiture of peace. You forfeit your peace to pursue something that you can't have, that's not yours. And it's replaced with a sinful dissatisfaction with the things that you've already been blessed with. So the first aspect of allowing covetousness into your heart is that it robs you of your peace. The second aspect, the second reality of allowing covetousness into your life is that it robs you of your relationships. You cannot, 
And you will not truly experience joy in your relationships, in your friendships, in your working relationships if you're unable to be happy for those who, who, who are around you that are blessed in areas and ways that you are not. You will never experience peace in your relationships if you cannot be happy for those who are blessed in areas that you are not. Ultimately, covetousness, coveting, is about competition. You've heard the phrase keeping up with the Joneses, right? You know, it's about keeping up with the Joneses. And when you're coveting someone else's possessions, when you're coming, coveting someone else's relationships, when you're coveting someone else's career, when you're coveting someone else's looks, beauty, health, when you're coveting those things, then there's a measure of competition that seeds into your heart. And you cannot connect where there's competition. It's not going to happen. Because you're going to be constantly trying to outdo the other person. In my own life, uh, <clears throat> I was in youth group, you know, I don't know, when I'm 17. And I got to know this guy who's, uh, who became a friend. And, and you know, we, we became, we both had this like-mindedness where we wanted to preach and teach. And we wanted to shepherd and be pastors. And, and so that kind of like glued our friendship for that season of our life. And, you know, we graduated high school and life happens. And so we and I kind of, he and I kind of went separate ways. And, and I went off to school to, to learn ministry and to learn how to teach and preach. And uh, this friend of mine went a different direction and he was gifted in the area of business. And he started his own business in kind of like the tech field and uh, became very successful. And he and I crossed paths again when we were about I don't know, 23, 24, and uh, he was married, I was married, he had two kids, I had two kids, and it was like, wow, this is perfect. So we, you know, we started hanging out again, and, um, but the problem is, is I was in ministry, and I don't know if you guys know, ministry doesn't make you a ton of money, and so I was, we were struggling a little bit at the time, and financially, and, and my friend had uh, started his own company, and it was, doing very well for himself and was making a lot of money. They were very financially secure. And so when we began meeting and hanging out, I found that even though he was financially secure, he was coveting my position in ministry because that's what he wanted to do in the, in the long run. And here I was in ministry doing what I knew that God had called me to do, but coveting his financial security and seeing him being able to have no struggles and pretty much have whatever he wanted. And all of a sudden, because we were immature, young husbands, young fathers, there became this competition where he coveted my ministry position, I coveted his financial security, and we found ourselves constantly trying to outdo one another. And what it caused us to not be able to do is become connected relationally. And our friendship became sacrificed at the altar of covetousness because we allowed competition to get in the way of connection because that's what coveting does it causes us to become disconnected disconnected relationally around us disconnected with God because we're seeking something rather than him disconnected with uh, our own peace covetousness breeds disconnection robs us of our relationships so we understand that covetousness, coveting, robs us of our peace. It robs us of our relationships. But most importantly, we have to understand that it robs us of our worship. Coveting robs us of our worship. It's amazing to me how God works. You know, I, I, in the very beginning of this message, we talked about how um, the message has never changed. Love God, love people. That's Exodus Exodus 20. Matthew 22, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. Love God, love people. You know, we're talking a few thousand years, a couple thousand years span this time, and the message has never changed. Love God and love people. And so you get the first commandment, love the Lord your God, put him first. And then you get to the 10th commandment, which is do not covet. And what's amazing to me is it all just circles back around. Because if you break the 10th commandment, You've already broken the first commandment. 
Because if you're coveting something, if you're greatly desiring something, it means you've already put something above God. It just circles back around. It's amazing. And the reality is, is that anything that you're coveting, anything that you're desiring greatly and seeking after greatly, something that you've allowed to grasp your attention, grasp your devotion, grasp your focus, no matter what it is, if it's coming first before God in your life, that thing, anything that you put before God in your life becomes an idol. It becomes the object of our worship. It becomes the object of our devotion. And when we allow something to rob our attention, attention to become that vacuum of our time, our thoughts, our emotions, our worship, that thing becomes an idol. Maybe we never intended to say, oh, I worship this car. And that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But the reality is, is that's what we do. Is those things become idols in our lives. And they get our worship. They get our devotion. To quote Todd Wagner again, and I love this quote, is, sin will take you farther than you wanted to go, cost you more than you ever wanted to pay, and keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay. And the same reality comes true when we allow idols, idols to enter into our lives. They will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay, keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay. They're not, you are not meant to worship both. You're not to have, meant to have split devotion or split worship. Your worship is meant to be singularly focused on God. That's it, period. In fact, in Matthew 6, 24, Jesus is talking about worry and anxiety. And uh, has anybody in here ever worried about their financial situation? No? Not me either. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, all of us have. You know, we've all gone through that. And so Jesus is teaching about, you know, overcoming worry and anxiety. And he's specifically relating it to financial situations. And so in Matthew 6, 24, when talking about that, he says this. He says, nobody can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Guys, worship is singularly focused. We can't have split worship. It, that, that doesn't happen. And you were created to worship. No matter, no matter what you do, I'm telling you right now, if you don't worship God, you're going to worship something. Because you were created to worship. Oh, the unbelieving world out there, they don't even realize it, but they're worshiping. There are people who worship their own physique and body and spend half their life in the gym. There are people who worship their careers. There are people who worship their status. There are people who worship all different aspects. Even if they're not worshiping God, they're going to worship something because we were created to worship. So we understand that coveting from a macro perspective, we understand what it is. It's desiring something you don't have Something that consumes our, it's, it's something that consumes our thoughts, destroys your peace, destroys your relationships, and takes your worship from a macro perspective. But from the micro perspective, the New Testament perspective, what does it mean to not covet? Paul, he's the greatest missionary who has ever walked this earth. Aside from Jesus, I don't think anybody has influenced the world as much as the Apostle Paul. He's changed this world for the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this guy has lived his life, did live his life, and his life was a shining example of a direct contrast to what it means to covet. When he wrote the book of Philippians, which our ladies are studying, our men's group is studying, um, which a little plug here, men's group are starting a new book study also, so can't let the women have all the glory here. Um, men, we're starting a new book study this Thursday. But, so when Paul is writing the book of Philippians, he's, he's imprisoned. Some think that he was locked up in a jail cell. Some think he was like in house, wor or house worship. That was house church, no. He was at house arrest. At, in some way or some capacity, Paul was being held against his will. And he was under lockdown. 
And so he writes the book of Philippians, which is, if you don't know, is a letter to the church in Philippi. So he's writing in a letter of encouragement to a group of people who live in this place called Philippi. And in, the, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, this is Paul who's under arrest, who's, who is being held against his will, and he says this. He says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. And any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I love Philippians 4.13. But it is one of the most misinterpreted scriptures in all of the New Testament. You know, like when I was in high school, you had Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I don't know if that was a thing when you were in high school. But we had a Christian organization in our high school called Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And it was all these athletes that would get together. And they would, we would have a devotional and a time of worship and Bible study. <laughs> and, and so when we would get together, um, you would see this, this scripture on like, nine out of ten kids' t-shirts or hats or something, you know, and, and their interpretation of this is like, yeah, I can score this touchdown because, you know, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, and, and like you go to, if you guys remember Family Christian Store, I think they went bankrupt now, but you remember Family Christian Store, like you walk in there and there's like Philippians 4.13 on like nine out of ten things in that entire store, you know, and, and there's this idea that, well, I can do anything, absolutely anything. I can score this touchdown. I can score this business deal. I can become incredibly successful. Because why? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the reality is, is that is an, in, in a drastically, uh, is a terrible misinterpretation of that scripture. Because what Paul is saying here in Philippians 4.13, is he's saying, whether I am, whether I'm filled with blessing or whether I'm going through the desert of life. I can do both. Why? Because Christ in me. It's not about what you can get. It's not about what you can accomplish. It's about what you're able to go through because of God's goodness inside of you. The reality is, is that Paul, what Paul is saying here is that we can go through seasons of plenty or we can go through seasons of need because Christ, the Spirit of God, is inside of us. It's not because of money. It's not because of stuff. It's not because of possessions. It's because of Jesus. Paul could have easily said, you know, to the Philippians, like, look at you chumps. I'm the leader of this place. You know, I'm the leader of this gig, and now I'm stuck in jail. I should, the one, I, be, I should be the one out of here. You guys should be in here, because look at all I do for the gospel. He could have easily said that. But instead, Paul says that he's learned to be, in, be content in every situation. The New Testament perspective is far more than just, hey, guys, don't covet. Don't covet your neighbor's donkey. <laughs> what it is is to learn to be content with every aspect of your life. Whether you're going through a season of immense blessing and God, and it feels like God's blessing is just poured out on you, or whether you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, it's learning to be content and resting in his peace no matter what you're going through. That's the macro perspective. That's the gospel perspective. Amen. So how do we do it? How do we accomplish that? How did Paul do it? You know, and, and how do we follow his footsteps? Because that's, I mean, that's, that's the crux of it. It's like, okay, I understand. Learn to be content in all seasons and all situations. That's fantastic. How do we do that? Well, I'm going to read to you some scriptures. These are all from the Apostle Paul. And these are all the beginnings of letters that he wrote to various churches throughout the world. Are you ready? Romans 1.8, the start of the book of Romans. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. 
1 Corinthians 1, 4, letter to the Corinthian church. These were people who were messed up, man. These were people who were filled with sexual sin and idolatry, and they were like messing up in area, every area of life. And Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 1, 4, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 16, writing to the church in Ephesus, he says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Philippians 1, 3, the script, the book we just read out of. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Colossians 1, 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you. 2 Timothy 1, 3. I thank God whom I serve. Philemon verse 4. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. Do you guys see a theme here? Paul was able to be, to be content in every aspect of his life, no matter what he was going through, because Paul lived a lifestyle of thanksgiving. God, thank you. Thank you. Guys, there's a reality and a truth that we have to understand today. The cure to covetousness is being thankful for what you've been blessed with, no matter what you have. No matter where you are, no matter what season you're going through, the key to curing a covetous heart is to being thankful. When we have a thankful heart, we're to overcome with joy and thanksgiving for what we have so that we don't have time to spend our emotions and our time and our energy on worrying about what we don't have. We can just be thankful. Guys, the destruction of a covetous heart begins with the development of a thankful heart. So my challenge to you, church, is this. Begin thanking God every single day. Even when you don't want to, even when you have to search for things to be thankful for, I'm telling you right now, if you took three minutes you could find several areas of your life where you can thank God that he has moved in your, powerfully in your life. So my challenge for you is this. Thank God every day for areas that he's blessed you with. And I don't mean like get up and think about it. I mean audibly get up every single morning and begin going through a list of areas where God has blessed you and begin praising him and thanking God audibly for the areas that he has blessed you in your life. And I'm telling you, your perspective will begin to shift. Your heart will begin to change. And you will begin to see this covetousness roll off. And all of a sudden, a measure of grace that you will begin to experience will increase in a way that you never thought possible. Begin thanking God. Today, that's my challenge to you. Overcome covetousness. A lot of times we don't even recognize that we're being covetous. We are. We don't recognize we're coveting, but we are. Be thankful. But ultimately, we begin living the life that God designed us to live. Because that's what this whole series is about, is how can we live the life that God designed us to live. Ultimately, we begin living the life that God designed us to live more than just a thankful heart but a heart that is completely surrendered to Jesus. Today you need to know that God has a life destined for you that is far greater, far more amazing than you could ever think or imagine. But it all begins by allowing him, Jesus, to lead you and guide you. Surrendering yourself to the leading, and, a leading of God and allowing him to change you from the inside out. This morning, as we've done this entire series, we're going to pray a prayer. And the words are going to be up on the screen. Maybe you're here today and you have given your life to Christ, but you're struggling this area of coveting. And it's robbed you of your peace. It's robbed you of your relationships. Maybe even has robbed you of your worship. I want you to pray this prayer with us as a confession. Lord, change me. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus and you want to experience the life that God has destined for you, I want you to join us in praying this prayer. There's no magic words up here. All it's about is just surrendering yourself to Jesus, laying it down before him and saying, I need you. And so we're going to pray together. And so uh, I want you guys to join me as we go before the Lord in prayer. Would you guys join me?
Please repeat after me. Jesus, I realize that I'm lost without you. I believe that you lived a perfect life and died on the cross for me. I believe that you rose from the grave conquering death. So I put my trust in you. I don't want to keep doing life how I have been. So help me to change. In Jesus' name, amen.